Welcome to this webinar on the promises and perils of proposed transatlantic trade and investment partnership for food and agriculture. I'm Karen Hansen Kuhn. I'm Director of International Strategies at the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy. ITP works locally and globally at the intersection of policy and practice to ensure fair and sustainable food farm and trade systems. The third round of negotiations for TTIP begins today in Washington, D.C. That agreement could link to the world's biggest economies. What's interesting about this agreement is the extent to which it's not really just about traditional trade barriers. Tariffs between our countries are already quite low. What's squarely on the agenda, the government agenda, is what they call localization barriers to trade. So in essence, it's about changing the rules that govern our economies, including our food system. Today, my colleague Steve Subban and I will explore some of the issues covered in a paper we produced with the Heinrich Bold Foundation, particularly the way the trade agreement could affect local foods programs, food safety, and financial regulations. Then, Karen Ulmer from the EU Development Agency, OPERDEV, and the EU Coalition Agriculture and World Co. Convention 2020 will expand on some of the European perspectives on these issues. So, to get started, um, I'd like to explain just a few technical issues. Uh, first, you can listen in either through your computer or by telephone. Uh, information for phoning in is on the audio panel on the right side of the screen. If you want to do that, select the telephone button and the information will appear. Second, participants can enter questions into their question box at the bottom of the control panel. What you see now on the screen shows you just type this in now. Uh, we'll be collecting those questions during the discussion, and then I will be reading them out for the panelists after the presentations have been made. Finally, this webinar will be recorded and will be available at ITP.org and ITP's YouTube page. So to start, I'd like to have a few words from our partner, Bastian Hermesen, uh, who is the director of the Heinrich Boll Foundation's Brussels office. Thank you very much, Karen, and welcome also on behalf of the Heinrich Böll Stiftung and greetings from Brussels. For those of you who do not know us, we are a German political foundation affiliated with the German Green Party. With 30 offices worldwide, we cover a wide range of policy, policy issues from a global perspective. Environmental, energy, and climate policies are some of our core concerns in this respect. And in this context, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership is not just the hot topic of the hour, but it will be on our minds and our political agendas for the years to come. And I'm very glad that we're able to partner up with IATP for this important study on one of the most crucial aspects of the TTIP today, and I look forward to our continued cooperation. It is important to realize that the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership will be unlike any of the free trade agreements of the EU or the United States before. It is of a different scale and a different scope than any previous trade agreements. Therefore, there will be different expectations and a different level of public interest. You can already sense this in Brussels today, and TTIP will surely be popping up as a topic in the upcoming election to the European Parliament in May 2014 as well. Therefore, I'm glad that you are showing this interest in TTIP already today for this webinar, and it will be very necessary for all of us to get involved if we want to turn this agreement into a valuable instrument of sustainability, or at least to prevent the worst and avoid the risks within TTIP, some of which we will discuss today. Together with our office in Washington, D.C. and our headquarters in Berlin, we will continue to provide valuable policy analysis and input on the TTIP. We will also foster a dialogue and stronger cooperation of civil society across the Atlantic and to inform the public about the potential pitfalls and or applicable promises which TTIP could offer. In this, we will continue to strive for the highest level of transparency and civil society engagement in the TTIP negotiations and for achieving higher environmental, consumer, and labor standards rather than supporting a transatlantic race to the bottom. Again, thank you all for being here with us today, and I look forward to the inputs and the discussion. And with that, back to you, Karen. Thank you. Um, let's 
So over the last few years, there's been a tremendous increase in community efforts to revitalize food systems. This is true in the U.S. and the EU, really all over the world. Whether establishing local farmers markets, expanding supply to school programs, or building local campaigns to label our foods, people are taking a square look at our unhealthy food and diets and building a new system from the ground up. These healthier, more sustainable, more equitable systems also build bridges between local farmers and consumers to achieve fairer prices on both sides. However, these fragile new initiatives rely on leveraging public support, particularly local, state, and federal procurement dollars to increase the demand for their goods and secure better prices. So one question we need to ask is whether the provisions in TTIP will help or hinder that process. I took this information from the National Farm to School website. You can see that Farm to School programs are active in all 50 states in the United States uh, and reach millions of students every day. This is one of the most visible signs of change in local food programs. Uh, in addition, there are proposals to expand beyond Farm to School to initiatives such as Farm to Hospital or Farm to Daycare uh, in states such as Minnesota, Oklahoma, Vermont, and others. Farm to school programs are also active in the European Union, um, in Italy, for example. Even beyond considering healthy and locally grown foods, uh, decision makers weigh criteria on culture and how foods fit into education programs. In addition, we've seen a lot of new activity at the municipal level. Uh, Food policy councils that involves various stakeholders from the food system are emerging in many cities around the country and in Canada and Europe. Uh, Los Angeles Food Policy Council is one of the most ambitious of these. It includes the school system, restaurants, workers, farmers, and consumers. And together, they come together to develop the Good Foods Purchasing Pledge, which would guide both public procurement and a lot of private dollars. In that case, it includes uh, support from local communities, so farm to school kinds of criteria but also environmental sustainability, workforce values, animal welfare, and nutrition. The preferences in these cases are decided, although not exclusively local, you know, about rebuilding that local food system. So the question that comes up for us is, is this progress doubling up from the grassroots uh, on the agenda in the trade talks? And here we do have some clear signs that the EU is interested in including procurement at all levels for all goods in all sectors. Now, this goes beyond questions of local foods, of course. It includes all kinds of uh, public contracts um, for different kinds of programs. The EU has stated that it wants to go beyond the plurilateral government procurement agreement. That's an agreement uh, that includes a number of countries. It's housed at the World Trade Organization. Both the U.S. and the EU are parties to that agreement, and it permits 37 U.S. states. The EU has said it wants to go beyond the GPA uh, to include those 13 states that are not already a part of it, as well as 27 major cities, including Los Angeles. And even beyond that, for, for those states that are part of GPA and those that are not, it wants broader procurement commitments, that is, opening up more sectors, more activities, uh, to competition for EU firms. So, in understanding whether this would make a difference in local foods programs, we need to think about how procurement is usually dealt with in trade agreements. So, very briefly, for the most part, bidding preferences, that is, the, the concepts that are weighed in determining which firm gets the contract, are for the most part based on on performance. In the case of foods, it would be the size of the tomato that looks fresh. But what's negotiated specifically with each and every trade agreement are exclusions. So exclusions for school feeding programs, for example, and already set aside environmental criteria. Um, the recent U.S. Korea for trade agreements, for example, included specified that criteria to conserve the environment and to ensure compliance with labor laws. Um, were acceptable. Um, now this is what's important here to remember is these are not the default positions. The default is to include everything. And then these uh, exclusions are set aside or set up in each and every trade agreement. So 
In addition to considering how our food is grown, we need to think about what happens between the point when it leaves the pond and it arrives in our plates. So we consider not only what's in our food, which is some of what Steve will be talking about, but also the health impacts and chemicals that are used in food packaging, particularly of the chemicals we've been looking at called hormone disruptors, among them bisphenol A. BPA is used in food and drink containers, baby bottles, and food cans. Um, there's considerable evidence that even low dose exposure uh, can result in reproductive problems, cancer, and even contribute to rising obesity rates. I select this out because it's an important example of where a problem has been identified and there is not yet legislation or there are not yet rules at the federal level. So in the U.S., 12 states have banned the use of BPA in baby bottles and there are other uh, things under underway. In the EU, Denmark, France, Belgium, and Sweden have also banned the use of BPA in baby bottles. And a Swedish member of parliament has proposed uh, that BPA be on the agenda for fast-track consideration in the broader EU process. So that's the progress from the bottom. From the top, these issues are dealt with very differently in the US and EU. The EU has a program called REACH, the Regulation on Registration, Evaluation, Authorization, and Restrictions of Chemicals. Uh, REACH is firmly grounded in the precautionary principle so that in situations of scientific uncertainty, regulators can take a cautious approach to keep the food system safe or the environment if the number of dead chemicals are being used. It utilizes a hazards-based approach uh, so that gathering information from companies about whether a substance could have negative impacts can encourage substitution of hazardous chemicals with safe alternatives. The U.S. program, uh, POSCA, the Toxic Substance Act of 1976 is much more limited and in fact efforts have been underway for more than a decade uh, to modify it. So far under Tosca um, there's been safety testing of just 280,000 potentially harmful chemicals. In this case uh, they utilize a risk-based approach uh, so that um, the burden of proof is on the government to prove that a chemical is unsafe before it enters the food system. The U.S. Trade Representative has complained bitterly about the REACH approach, particularly in meetings at the WTO on technical barriers to trade. Um, in, in its own report on technical barriers to trade, it cites that it has been complaining at each and every WTO meeting since 2003 that these limitations on chemical use are a distortion of trade. If we look at comments made to USTR by various industry groups, particularly uh, in in setting up TTIP, um, they mirror those complaints. And in fact, uh, the American Chemistry Council specifically cites its objections to the EU rule for endocrine receptors, and ECLA, as a disruption on trade flows. So there is a solid uh, momentum from the US side to push back against the REACH process in the EU. Now, Discussions have started with what we understand as if negotiators are already recognizing that these two uh, very different systems uh, may be too difficult to bridge within the trade agreements directly. So there's been discussion both in the U.S. and EU of establishing mutual recognition agreements um, within the context of the trade agreement. So in essence, um, this would mean that any safety assessments conducted in one country would be treated as valid in another. This is a complex topic, and I would certainly recommend uh, looking at the website of the Center for International Environment and Law, uh, which has written some outstanding analysis of the concerns around this issue. So, in conclusion, when I consider how uh, TTIP could affect uh, local food systems, I think about two sets of issues. The first is the extent to which the rules established in the trade agreement could cut off progress at the local level in rebuilding our broken food systems. I think this is a vitally important issue that we need to continue to explore in various aspects of the agreement. And then secondly, the extent to which the rules established in TTIP 
as well as Trans-Pacific Partnership could influence the global process of rule setting because if particular standards, say on chemicals or procurement, are established in these two agreements, there is little doubt that they will circle back to the WTO at some point in the future. So I think these are just a few of the issues we, we begin to cover. We, we deal with these issues in somewhat more depth in the paper. It's also available on our website. Um, but next, I will turn to my colleague Steve Sitchan to discuss uh, these issues in, a, in somewhat greater depth, uh, particularly issues around um, food safety and finance rules that could be included in TTIP. Dr. Steve Sitchan is Senior Policy Analyst at IEPP for Finance, Trade, and Food Security. He's been with us uh, for quite a while, and we turn to him now. Okay, um, well, uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about sanitary and phytosanitary issues and technical barriers to trade as they've been um, discussed thus far in the, in the TTIP negotiation. Uh, sanitary and phytosanitary issues concern uh, food safety and animal health and uh, technical barriers to trade have to do with issues such as uh, uh, labeling, uh, uh, food quality and uh, packaging. Um, let me just talk a little bit about the overall rationale uh, uh, for the TTIP. Uh, there have been efforts for more than 20 years uh, to start a free trade agreement uh, between the United States and the European Union member states. And, uh, and, and these have floundered on for, for various reasons. But um, as, uh, as Rahm Emanuel uh, said when he was chief of staff, you should never waste a crisis. And the crisis that was triggered by the financial uh, deregulation of, uh, of 2000 to uh, 2007 uh, produced a crisis situation in which uh, uh, the Transatlantic uh, Business Council uh, decided that it was time to uh, reintroduce the purpose of, uh, of the uh, of a trans transatlantic uh, agreement. And so uh, they decided to remove trade irritants to grow jobs in the economy. That would be the overall uh, rationale. Uh, and these irritants, of course, uh, concern uh, regulations that affect uh, consumers and the environment. Uh, this uh, rationale is usually expressed in terms of uh, econometric estimates for uh, job creation according to a, a formula in the case of, of uh, agriculture, um, every $1 billion of ag exports attributed to TTIP would create 6,800 jobs. These aren't, uh, doesn't mean that there are more farmers, it could mean that there are more farm workers making uh, $8 an hour who used to work in Mexico before they were uh, forced to leave because they have to do away with their uh, jobs. Um, SPS and TBT issues are overwhelmingly about market access. They're, they're not about uh, public health. They're not really even about am, animal health. It's not a surprise that uh, the USTR, the US Trade Representative, has the same negotiator for market access and the SPS chapters. Uh, the European uh, Union, on its hand, uh, President Barroso, has promised that the EU will retrofit all of its environment, health, and safety laws uh, to promote jobs and growth. So everything will go under review in terms of whether or not uh, it fulfills this uh, industry and government co-determined jobs and growth uh, rationale. So uh, the, the kind of leitmotif of uh, SBS and TBT issues in the TTIP is that it's beyond WTO. Um, the US EU high level working group on jobs and growth proposed a TTIP uh, SPS consultative group but uh, perhaps even more important than this consultative group is the chapter on regulatory convergence and coherence. Um, corporate uh, uh, Europe Observatory uh, today released an analysis of a leaked, of a leaked uh, proposal uh, by the European Commission, European Commission for this chapter, according to which effectively industry would become the co-writer of regulations and would have early warning privileges uh, to allow industry to indicate when 
uh, in its EU regulations would be trade distorting, unquote, unquote. Um, there is uh, uh, another um, feature of the TIP, which basically puts uh, public law uh, under the judgment by three, three panel uh, private tribunals and um, the investor state dispute settlement provision is probably one of the most um, powerful uh, means for not just uh, changing regulations but preventing new regulations uh, uh, from occurring. And there is a lot of dispute about whether or not uh, this dispute settlement mechanism will apply to SPS and TBT issues because if there is a judgment uh, in the case of a brand name uh, company, uh, the, there could be massive consumer uh, retaliation. Uh, it's one thing to uh, overthrow the mining laws of Guatemala uh, through uh, investor state. It's another thing to do it with a uh, transnational uh, uh, serial. So some sample demands uh, made by industry in grains and oil seeds. Um, the U.S. Trade Representative, the Biotechnology uh, Industry Organization and its European counterpart, Eurobio, are demanding um, the commercialization of uh, 70 uh, genetically modified seed events, that is a very particular slice of data uh, chosen by the industry, presented to regulators by their, uh, for their review, in this case by the European Food Safety Authority, which judged these 70 events to be safe, that is not safe according to any kind of pre-market safety test, but safe according to a literature review uh, in comparison with uh, conventional counterparts. Uh, the U.S. Grain Export Council um, wishes to have automatic approval of multi-trait uh, seed varieties if the single traits are EFSA approved. The assumption here is that uh, there is no interaction between the traits, that this is uh, a biological impossibility and they should do what the United States does, which is uh, automatic approval. Uh, Crop Life America, uh, EU uh, rules on pesticides as endocrine disruptors are too stringent. So endocrine disruptors uh, uh, cause uh, malfunction um, in hormonal uh, development, particularly in children. Uh, Crop Life America has warned the U.S. Trade Representative that there will be a 40% cut to uh, U.S. ag exports if the EU rules concerning pesticide residues on food uh, are maintained. Uh, sample uh, demands on meat hygiene. Um, the World Animal Health Organization has evaluated European member state controls on uh, bovine spongiform encephalitis or mad cow disease to be uh, a controlled risk. And uh, I could go into details about how these uh, standards are cooked up, but um, the United States, uh, which tests about 40,000 uh, uh, beef cattle, a year post-mortem, of course, for, uh, for BSE out of, a, out of a herd of some uh, 30, 35 million, it keeps shifting. Um, the, uh, the, the EU is, is demanding that uh, uh, that be, be able to uh, uh, export its lamb and beef products to the United States, uh, which has this negligible risk standard. Um, the, there's a very controversial number of, of beef, of um, livestock growth hormones, uh, a few of which are banned in the European Union. Um, there was a very controversial vote last year in Codex by a vote of two, uh, Iractopamine, a, a failed asthma drug that's used for uh, promoting uh, uh, meat growth uh, in, uh, in pork, in, in hogs. Uh, uh, the, there's a good chance that the United States will demand uh, that that hormone be allowed uh, for use in its exports. Uh, the U.S. is also uh, demanding that uh, Europeans accept meat rinsed with various uh, diluted forms of chlorine because the United States uh, allows uh, the production of poultry uh, whereby uh, inspectors only have one-third of a second uh, to look at each carcass and determine whether it meets uh, U.S. meat inspection standards. So instead of dealing with uh, the 
issue of slowing down the line speed, they rinse uh, poultry with chlorine. Um, there is a private, effective privatization of the U.S. meat system uh, called the HACCP uh, Inspection Models Project, heavily criticized by the U.S. Inspector General uh, of, uh, excuse me, the Inspector General of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Um, the European Commission informed Australia uh, that the Australian version of, of HIP uh, would be a, a violation of EU conflict of interest law. And so if the United States attempts to uh, export meat uh, that has been privately inspected, uh, that could certainly cause a trade dispute. Um, now passing on to uh, emerging technologies. Uh, both the United States and the European Union member states have invested heavily in nanotechnology, uh, which is the use of atomic to molecular size materials whose properties uh, are able to have various um, uh, attractive industrial uses. Current uses uh, would include uh, putting carbon nanotubes uh, to reinforce car bumpers, um, using uh, uh, nanomaterials to improve uh, heat transmission, uh, electricity transmission, so on and so forth. In agriculture, um, there is a wide array of products that are in research and development, but um, according and, and as a result of this, of the, uh, the importance of this uh, technology to both the U uh, U.S. and the EU, um, this has received uh, presidential attention, and basically regulators are required not only to carry out their statutory duties concerning uh, health. Uh, welfare, safety, and our environment, as it says here in, in President Obama's executive order, but they also have to uh, include uh, promotion of economic growth, innovation, competitiveness, and job creation, which are not part of their statutory uh, duties. Uh, the decisions must be based on the best available science. The most important word in that uh, executive order is available because much of what is uh, uh, submitted by companies to uh, governments is called confidential business information, and uh, sometimes the best science simply is not applied. Uh, so some emerging food technology issues to conclude. Um, currently, the U.S. Uh, uh, biotechnology approval system, it's always approval, there are no, no rejections in the U.S. regulatory review process, is based on a 1986 a framework agreement that is simply inapplicable uh, to emerging technologies. Um, back in the day, uh, Food and Drug Administration officials opposed uh, this framework because it was basically a legal doctrine called substantial equivalence between GMOs and, uh, uh, and their conventional counterparts. But in the brave new world of synthetic biology, uh, despite 10 years of uh, lawyerly review, nobody has been able to find a way to extend this framework agreement. Um, there are about 300 uh, food-related products with nanomaterials, according to a 2013 inventory of, of the Center for Food Safety, which has done excellent work um, on uh, nanotechnology, including uh, launching the first ever lawsuit against the government United States for failure to regulate. Uh, and ne nevertheless, uh, uh, tests uh, have shown that there are uh, nanomaterials in foods, uh, particularly a, a Dutch study uh, which estimated um, uh, the uh, incidence of nanosilica in uh, various uh, processed foods. There is no uh, or almost no nanospecific regulation Right now, governments have chosen to try to regulate, quote, unquote, uh, nanomaterials and food under inapplicable uh, uh, toxicology uh, measurements. Part of the difficulty of, of nanotechnology from a regulatory viewpoint is that the, um, the kind of dose mass um, uh, measurements that are traditional in toxicology simply aren't applicable because the mass of the nanomaterials used is so, so, so tiny. Um, and there is uh, a great deal of debate about um, how and whether to go ahead regulating nanotechnology because 
when, uh, for example, the Environmental Protection Agency tried to get uh, industry to forward uh, data about nanomaterials in their products, uh, industry responded that even to submit data would be to t stigmatize the technology. And nevertheless, the government continues to fund private partner, uh, private public partnership projects uh, with a mounting mass of uh, what it hopes will be um, very useful uh, applications with uh, no regulation. And finally, um, there's, uh, there's reason to believe that um, there could be a uh, dispute about the labeling of products with nanomaterials. The European Parliament uh, made uh, a non-binding resolution to that effect. The American Chemical Council immediately responded that the U.S. Trade Representative should take uh, the European Union to, uh, to WTO dispute settlement, uh, which is at least a public process uh, if it went ahead, if the European Union went ahead and labeled uh, nanomaterial products. Thank you very much, and again, I apologize for that little difficult technical delay at the start. So hello, I'm Karen speaking now. So I'm going to respond or echo some of the concerns from the European civil society organizations. And um, I'm speaking on behalf of two organizations. The one is ARC, Agricultural and Rural Convention, that brings together a range of environmental, rural development, farming, health and development organizations. And who have been working a, a lot together on bringing about good and healthy and fair food in Europe. and um, I myself am working with UPRDEF, which is a development organizations in Europe fighting poverty and um, working for global justice and food security. I would like to just refer quickly to the European Commission's own communication on TTIP to illustrate the strategic dimension of TTIP again. Um, they're saying that um, the objective is to provide a clear, reasonable definition of the real strategic potential of TTIP which is obviously more than just another free trade agreement, not only because of its scale, but also because it will result in the EU and the US to show leadership on world trade, setting global precedents in regulatory areas. Hence, there is an importance also to look at EU-US um, negotiations around the TTIP with regard to its impact on other countries in the global south. Um, we have heard already about food safety standards from Steve, so just recall that this is a serious concern of many European civil society organizations. We consider that food safety standards are currently better or in, and are at risk to be under attack in these negotiations. Um, the EU's approach to look at food is um, looking at the whole food chain, so from the farc, farm to fork, and um, looking at the use of pesticides, hormones and chemicals. And to this, the EU's precautionary principle applies, which is a commitment under the EU's, EU's um, treaty obligations. So we very much adhere and want to uphold this precautionary principle, which we hear is um, not applied in the same way in the US. Hence, uh, a concern that this may be weakened. And this relates then also to the SPS measures that um, Steve has been pointing out with regard to human, animal, and plant health and to highlight that there are other regulations ongoing at the European level, for example, the EU's regulation on a more sustainable use of pesticides, looking also into pest control. The question is, what happens to those regulations and attempts to improve European regulation on um, sustainable use of pesticides? Another initiative is ongoing on safe chemicals. The question, what and where will TTIP negotiations have an impact or undermine some of those initiatives? We're already seeing that some of the reviews of um, EU legislation, for example, the EU seed law, is done in parallel and where we do see a much stronger trade logic prevailing over precautionary principle or over um, health and um, societal concerns. Now when we look into the food labeling, there's a concern that um, current labeling schemes may be weakened. The EU's um, food labeling is governed by the EU food information, which is um, looking at the benefit of consumers. Important here, it's about GMO, there's moratorium, which is not only based on scientific evidence, but also expresses a consumer choice in Europe, as do other labeling schemes on food additives. 
the understanding here that um, many of the industry considers this increasingly a technical barrier to trade and there is concern that um, this will be challenged or weakened. Another concern is around public procurement. We have heard that in the US there are local food councils and cities are starting to organize themselves. Similar in Europe, there are different kind of um, sustainable schemes provide local content or organic food to public procurement. We have an initiative called Eating Cities that looks at the consumption of cities in its relation to the rural environment. We also have schemes that support an angle of um, sustainable development with regard to public procurement, looking into fair trade and sustainable trading. The question what is happening if public procurement is more liberalized and more demands are made to, um, for non-discrimination. And just to point out that there may be an issue around the European's own EU um, Social and Cohesion Fund, which does support and promote different local initiatives. The question, will this be considered discriminative if European-owned companies or sourcing is um, supported while the US companies may not benefit from those benefits. Then the fourth concern is the whole question, how will the TTIP impact on efforts at European level to promote and support and increase sustainable agriculture, to promote local, small-scale and ecolo ecological farming. A lot of work has been going into those um, a shift from unsustainable agriculture into sustainable agriculture. We do not hear any concern of this in the TTIP negotiations. However, a major effort has been made at the European level with regard to ongoing European agricultural policies and the last reform this year in 2013. So what many of us civil society organizations are working on and promoting is the multifunctionality of European agriculture, aiming at keeping farmers on the farm or on their farms, so promoting also land ownership by farmers, promoting diverse and site-specific farming schemes, supporting short food chains, that um, allow and sustain much closer links with consumers or commu community or farmers markets. A whole range of issues and programs to invest and promote more close nutrition cycles, increase soil quality, which is increasingly under threat, promote plant and seed diversity and agrobiodiversity and um, prevent and stop ongoing increase of monoculture. Huge concerns around factory farming a prevention of an increase or further um, spread of factory farming in Europe. Some initiatives that um, promote and look into decreasing Europeans' dependency on food, on feed and protein imports, in particular soya. And the whole issue around the reversing the logic of um, grow or go with an attempt to allow and use and um, emphasize the multifunctionality of agriculture with regard to its social, environmental and economic benefits. So the question to which extent will TTIP or can we challenge unsustainable and excessive competition and to which extent will TTIP support and promote competition that we consider unfair when it comes to social and environmental concerns. And just to recall there is a new figure that um, globally small-scale farmers work on only 22% of the land, however they do provide the bulk of food at global level. So we would like to see these small-scale farmers to be promoted. The question how and where does TTIP impact negatively on, those, on this? Hence the issue or the concern around corporate rights and market concentration. Will TTIP lead to increased market concentration, to increased efficiency gains in global value chains? What about antitrust regulations in the TTIP? Will they be strengthened to prevent increased market concentration? We understand there is already a proposal to prohibit to limit volumes of financial which would increase concentration of corporate sector. This falls under financial services and may also be subject to the investor state dispute settlement. Another question, what happens to existing European initiatives like the EU Green Paper that identifies a, a list of unfair trading practices in the business-to-business -business food and non-food supply chain in Europe? Will they be weakened or strengthened and what is, um, where do they 
link up with the TTIP. And then just to recall that um, the EU some years ago has been looking into an initiative beyond GDP, recognizing the limits of a GDP growth measurement and looking into other ways of well-being. What is happening to that? We hear that in the TTIP negotiations everything is focused on the increase of GDP, which it is claimed will provide wealth, prosperity and increasing jobs. And to conclude on the <clears throat> one last concern on the ISDS, the Investor to Stay Dispute Settlement, in addition to what has been mentioned already, we hear that um, there are some first cases that look and relate to land and water use. We have a case on Chevron versus Ecuador on, on avoiding compliance and water and land contamination. There is another pending case on Lone Pineres versus Canada on challenging fracking ban. So there is a key concern about um, the observation that there is a global rush on land for more energy and agricultural raw material for the bioeconomy. How does that relate and link to a more sustainable use of land where we improve and support and protect soil and water quality? And um, how will that impact on existing environmental safeguards? So all these issues are identified as concern. There are existing policy papers that look into more detail of some of those issues, but this was an attempt to sketch at a broader level the issues within the TTIP negotiations that um, different European civil society organizations are working on and will um, continue to look in more detail. Thank you. Hi, this is Karen again. Before we go on to questions, uh, we'll have a first response from our colleague Hannes Lorenzen. Hannes is Senior Advisor to the Committee on Agriculture and Rural Development of the European Parliament, and he's also a member of IATP's board. So, Hannes, I think you will be unmuted now, and can you give us your some early response? Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Uh, thank you very much to uh, Karen, Steve, and, and Karin. I think um, what you brought together is quite some evidence about um, you know, all the concerns that are raised in our societies about this, um, about the ongoing, um, very intransparent negotiations. And what I would like to raise here is how we can strategically. Um, make it clear what the corporate agenda behind this is as opposed to the movements which exist in our countries for a more local food system, for a more sustainable kind of food chain and so on. So um, I think what we should do when we discuss uh, what kind of common strategy we could have in order to make this process more known, more transparent, and further on to raise um, ideas about alternatives. I think we should be clear that uh, the pressure that comes from uh, corporations on both sides of the Atlantic to uh, melt down existing regulation to impose the, the neoliberal agenda once again, in, especially in the food sector, uh, the motives behind it is driven by a new approach uh, called bio, bioeconomy, uh, which goes far beyond the food production, which includes um, energy production, and which of course is um, uh, including all kinds of, um, Steve mentioned it, uh, nanotechnology in agriculture and so on. So that's the one side that is where the corporate agenda is driven and where the pressure comes from. On the other side, uh, Karen has very clearly said what has been achieved in this process of reforming common agriculture policy, uh, the demands from consumers to be uh, better informed about where the, their food comes from, uh, the um, organizations around cities trying to link up uh, to the production around uh, their cities. All these elements need to be highlighted in order to show people what is at stake. 
I think our ARC movement and organization and on the other side of the Atlantic, I think uh, several kind of movements have been very strong. Uh, Karen mentioned that at the beginning. I, I think we should, with all the good analysis we do about the bad things, we should be very clear where positive things are coming up and how we can raise that into a better public debate. I, I would leave it there. Uh, that's my first comment. I would very much like to draw from this webinar also elements of uh, how to strategically across the Atlantic bring these movements together and how to uh, also highlight all the positive um, movements that are going on. Uh, I think what we've reached through ARC in uh, uh, in, in cap reform might appear to very ambitious, uh, ambitious people uh, as low, uh, but I think we have a lot of elements which we can show are at stake, are under, under attack from this TTIP process. I leave it there for the moment. All right. Thank you, Hannes. We have a couple of questions to start with. Um, the first asks us to provide some context on the impacts of the U.S.-EU uh, connection, economic connection, for global food systems, especially in the global south. Um, and I guess I would start uh, with a little bit on that, say, if we think about some of the, the very ambitious goals of this agreement, I would say particularly around procurement and investment, for example, those are issues um, that aren't being dealt with at the WTO. In fact, they were rejected as part of the Doha round. Um, but if we have, for example, uh, new procurement rules come into place under TTIP and that include state and local and perhaps restrict things in ways we hadn't anticipated, and if the same thing happens with the Trans-Pacific Partnership, then you already have a lot of large economies committed to certain rules. And so I think there's much more pressure globally on the economies who have been left out of these talks uh, to join in and, and deal with these again at the WTO. I think the same is true for this very controversial investor state mechanism. So I think there is, there is clearly that issue around changing the standards, what's considered uh, the norm uh, of these kinds of agreements. Uh, but I'd like to open this up to some of the other panelists. Karen, I wonder if this is something you've thought about. It's for me, Karen. Well, I think one issue is certainly that the EU and US together are the biggest um, agricultural trade, um, will be responsible for the biggest agricultural trade flows. So in any way, the standards they're setting will influence and impact on, on other developing countries but also by the very fact of controlling or of shaping more the global value chains, there will be many impacts with regard to sourcing of agricultural raw material for these global value chains or of um, um, deciding what is um, relevant for middle class markets and what is relevant or can be sent and exported to lower purchasing uh, markets. So I think the, the impact and the scale of EU-US joint agricultural trade will be quite um, tangible for developing countries. Steve, did you have any comments on that question? Yeah, I think um, one of the long-range ambitions of the Transatlantic Business Council um, is to essentially preempt regulations that would be um, against their perceived economic interests. And insofar as SPS and TBT regulations are concerned, I think it's um, I think it's very telling that the uh, the expert groups of the Codex Alimentarius Commission um, have not been funded for several years now, to the point where um, the uh, the scientific articles that were used as the basis for this growth hormone. Uh, standard ractopamine were about 20 years old and there were only six studies and three of them were provided by industry. And so, you know, despite the fact that you always have to talk about uh, science-based standards, the unhappy fact of the matter is that, um, you know, 
developing countries are basically being put in a position of having to accept import of um, you know standards uh, of foods uh, with standards uh, based on uh, antiquated uh, and certainly not cutting edge science, not even the best science available. Thanks. We have another uh, question around opportunities for public intervention and organization against these threats. And I think this is something Hannes started to raise with us. Um, certainly I can tell people that this week here in Washington, D.C., there are a whole series of events intended to uh, raise public awareness of these issues. I think in about an hour there will be a press conference. Um, at late tomorrow we will have a teach-in at the Communication Workers of America. And if you look on our website or the website of Citizens Trade Campaign, which is citizenstrade.org, there's information about the webcast of that event, uh, which will include a broader range of issues than we're able to deal with today. Um, and, and many groups in the United States, some connected to the Citizens Trade <coughs> Campaign as well as others, are seeking to influence the debate around how these trade agreements are ratified, which is called fast track in our context. So I think there's starting to be a lot of um, activity within the U.S. Um, and we are starting to talk to our counterparts in Europe. I don't think we yet have a coordinated, a very coordinated strategy. I think we're starting to make some of those steps. Um, Karen, would you like to comment on that question? Um, shortly, there has been a European strategy meeting last week, bringing together all European organizations working on TTIP, not only on food and farming, and there is going to be a kind of platform um, that tries to em emphasize and identify a few key areas for co um, joint campaigning. And we also will look at the European level into food and farming strategizing at the beginning of January, trying to bring and identify the key issues and bring different stakeholders together. So it's, um, it's in the making. It's coming soon. Steve, did you have any comments on that question? Um, yeah, just, just real briefly. In the United States, um, uh, Senator Sherrod Brown has uh, propo proposed a uh, new bill for um, trade uh, legislative authorization where, where it would uh, assign parameters to the negotiators and be able to uh, periodically check uh, the trade negotiating performance to make sure that it would conform with congressional uh, requirements. And um, that piece of proposed legislation hasn't received uh, support, and yet um, there is some significant um, opposition to the form of the traditional form of trade promotion authority, in which basically Congress uh, reneges its constitutional uh, responsibility to advise and consent, and just votes up or down on uh, on a piece of of uh, negotiated text that not only can it not amend, but uh, uh, only very uh, very few members of Congress even see uh, before they are presented with uh, you know, the drop dead vote. So. There's some uh, very, very great challenges even for Congress, uh, much less for civil society members to find out what industry and the negotiators uh, have agreed upon. Thanks. Um, we have another question on if anyone, which I don't know the answer to, um, what the potential impact of TTIP might be on seed laws and regulation. Karen or Steve, do either of you know something about that issue? Well, here's a you know here's one of these situations where um, I, I think the likely approach would not be a direct challenge against uh, seed quality law or what they call or what the industry calls seed purity law. Um, the the overwhelming you know the intellectual property chapter of the uh, uh, as it's been you know, disclosed in the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership, shows uh, severe and radical um, IP uh, uh, disciplines that would affect um, uh, farmer seed development. And um, I think 
one of the things that is um, so telling about this negotiation is that whereas uh, agreements in the World Intellectual Property Organization um, are, are debated openly and uh, even indigenous peoples uh, are financed uh, to come to these meetings uh, because uh, genetic resource issues affect their livelihoods directly uh, and, their, and their way of life, whereas trade agreements for some reason are uh, sacrosanct um, and you know, they, they're, they're exempt from a number of, uh, of, of U.S. laws, including um, the law that governs uh, federal advisory committees. So uh, I, do think, I, I do think that this, an agreement in the intellectual property chapter would uh, have uh, severe consequences for how uh, both the U.S. and the EU in their entrepreneurial diplomacy approach this issue of seed purity uh, along with the biotech companies. Karen, did you have anything to add on that question? Just one comment that we, what we're seeing is that in parallel regulatory reforms seem to mirror somewhere a dynamic that is perhaps um, shaped by the negotiations in the TTIP. So with um, some first evidence on the EU seed law review, which is an extra own um, process, seems to suggest that um, there is prevalence for trade considerations. So trade related aspects are taking over or precedence over um, plant, soy, plant health or soil health when it comes to seed um, regulations and um, we have some evidence it seems that in other processes that some of the parallel ongoing regulatory reforms do and are shaped by some of the dynamics of the TTIP with regard to the president of um, to give trade related concerns a uh, prevalence. But um, the EU seed law is in the Parliament for co-decision making at this moment and will be there for the next few months in the new year and we will watch closely or some of the um, organizations will watch very closely. Okay. Um, Do you want one more I comment on seeds, Karen? Sure, Anna, go right ahead. Well, just, just very quickly, um, um, as Karen was um, mentioning it, it's in the Parliament and it's an interesting thing that right now as we are approaching European Parliament elections, um, those who have been very much in favor of driving the corporate agenda into this seed law uh, are withdrawing because they very much fear that it gets an issue for the election campaigns. And at the moment this process looks as if it's being stopped uh, with the rejection of the Commission proposal on a new seed marketing law. But I do agree this is a very important issue. I think that the situation on, on access to seeds and on um, farmers' rights um, and, and consumers' rights to know about it uh, is very different in, in the United States and in Europe. In Europe, without GMOs, without uh, uh, too many patents uh, in, involved in this, is a completely different situation. And the opposition to more concentration of market power in the seed sector is a very important thing, which I think we should very much relate to what's going on in TTIP negotiations. Thank you. Um, it looks like we are just about out of time. I do want to mention that a lot of, um, particularly what Steve and I discussed today, uh, what comes from a paper we wrote with the Heinrich Boll Foundation called Promises and Perils of the TTIP, Negotiating a Transatlantic Agricultural Market. That paper is available both on at IETP.org and on the Heinrich Boll website. Um, there are a few more questions that we don't have time to deal with right now, but we'll, what I will do is email them to the presenters, so perhaps we can continue the discussion that way. And also everyone who has signed up for this webinar uh, will receive a link with the recording later. I want to really thank the Heinrich Boll Foundation and, and Karen from uh, across the Atlantic as well as Hannes for participating in this webinar and uh, as well as all of you uh, who've been on the phone or, or at your computers. Thanks very much. <laughs>